The Storm Peaks, a mountainous haven that demands utmost caution. Here, the biting cold has the power to turn anyone into a human icicle, and the relentless winds are notorious for sweeping folks right off towering cliffs. These peaks, among the loftiest in the northern realms, stand shoulder to shoulder with the mighty Thaldrassus, which is the seat of power of the dragon aspects on the Dragon Isles. Venturing into the Storm Peaks is no lighthearted affair, as high winds and unpredictable avalanches make it a playground for risk takers. The wise sons of Hoder strongly advise travelers to bring along at least two companions, emphasizing the importance of safety in this treacherous terrain. Bearing the indelible marks of the Titan Forged Keepers, many mountains in the Storm Peaks resonate with ancient power. Notable among these peaks is the Temple of Storms, the dwelling place of the Titan Watcher Thorum. As if that weren't impressive enough, the legendary Titan City of Ulduar, a marvel in its own right, also finds its home nestled within these icy peaks. The Storm Peaks, with their daunting heights and mystical ties to the Titans, stand as a testament to both peril and wonder to the frosty corners of Northrend. The mighty North Wind once reigned supreme over the Storm Peaks, holding the land and its inhabitants, including the Tonka tribes, tightly in its grasp. In a courageous bid to free his people from the oppressive rule of the North Wind, Stormhoof, a valiant Tonka hero and the sibling of Chieftain Swiftspear from Camp Tonkalo, engaged in an epic battle on the Plain of Echoes. Despite weakening the North Wind, Stormhoof couldn't secure victory and succumb to the powerful force. Lying in wait, the North Wind patiently regained its strength, concocting a sinister plan for revenge against Stormhoof and his kin. Instead of confronting them directly, it opted for a more devious strategy, to rewrite history itself. The North Wind schemed to erase Stormhoof from the records of time, manipulating the timeline to ensure its continued dominance over the Storm Peaks. The recorded history of Tongalo underwent a malevolent change, depicting Stormhoof not as the liberator of his people, but as a villain executed for his so-called crimes. Thus, the Northwind sought not only to conquer the physical realm, but also to control the narrative, perpetuating its reign through the manipulation of the past. Now, when I was researching this, and I actually did the full quest line into this part with the Northwind, I was very confused because the Northwind isn't a time traveler. From what I understood, basically, the Northwind killed Stormhoof, and after he had killed Stormhoof, what he did is he didn't necessarily like change the timeline as they're kind of phrasing it. He just erased the history books. He changed the history books. So I don't know if it's just weird wording or if I'm just misunderstanding stuff, but that's kind of how I saw it when I was looking into this and when I did the quest. Because it seemed more like he didn't really change the timeline, like go back in time. He just realized that he could change the narrative to make Stormhoof look like the bad guy and the Northwind look solid, look like the hero. So I'm not really sure if I'm just misunderstanding something or if I just missed something in when I was doing the quest or what, but just it seems like saying that they manipulated the timeline just seemed off. Either way. That was my little gripe with it. I thought it was a cool quest though. I did think it was cool. Now let's get into some locations in Storm Peaks. I figure we can start with the main camps for the Alliance and Horde. First, let us start with the Horde, who have a base at Camp Tunkalo. Perched atop the lofty mountains in the eastern Storm Peaks, Camp Tunkalo is a quaint Tonka village with a unique vantage point. On one side it overlooks Dunnifilum, while on the other side it gazes upon the Plain of Echoes home to the shattered titan temple of life. This secluded spot has proven to be a sanctuary, shielding the village from the ravages of scourge attacks that have laid waste to many other Tonka settlements. The Bronzery brothers paid a visit to this remote village, initially met with cautious sentries, who observed from a safe distance. The dwarves' distinctive appearance raised eyebrows. Once recognized as not earthen or iron dwarves, a sense of politeness prevailed. Sensing the delicate balance, the dwarves, respectful of the villagers' space, chose not to overstay their modest welcome. Thus, Camp Tunkalo remained a tranquil haven, where the meeting of worlds added a subtle touch of intrigue to its mountainous embrace. Next we move over to Frosthold. Nestled in the southwestern reaches of Storm Peaks lies Frosthold, an alliance town harmoniously aligned with the Frostborn, 
This frosty haven is situated to the south of the Temple of Storms, and northwest of K3, perched on the same mountain as Stormcrest. Here, an entire race of frost dwarves call this icy retreat home, creating a unique settlement that sprawls around a colossal pit of ice atop the towering mountain. Reaching Frostwold isn't a stroll in the snowy park. It requires taking to the sky since there's no accessible path on foot. The Bronzebeard brothers made their way to Frosthold, where the Frostborn warmly welcomed Murad and Bronzebeard. They actually had found Murad and helped him heal when Arthas left him to die there, so he has a kinship with them ever since. Or as his friend Fjordland said to him, it's good to have two homes, you'll always have a hearth to sleep at. The visit unfolded with presentations, a hearty feast, and an evening of camaraderie, marked by shared drinks and stories. As night fell, Muradin, in a moment of trust, expressed his confidence in leaving the Frostborn in capable hands. Guided by the historian of Frosthold, he delved into the tale of an encounter between Mina Stormsmith, who was an ancestor of the brothers and the Frostborn, a saga dating back 500 years. In the heart of Frosthold, history and kinship intertwined, creating a memorable chapter in the frosty highlands of Stormpeaks. Perched above the enchanting snowblind terrace in east of Sefrelder village, Brunhilder village is a frosty haven in the southern expanse of Stormpeaks. Here, the formidable Frost of Rykul tribe, Hildener, establishes its stronghold. In a fascinating departure from the Valkyrian sisters, the Hildenar resisted the allure of the Lich King's offer, steering clear of the Scourge's ranks. The mountains surrounding the village cradle the nests of the proto-drakes they skillfully ride. Within the village, a unique social order prevails, strict matriarchy. Men, in their view, find purpose mainly in labor, often relegated to the forlorn mine, located to the north, either voluntary or as captives. At the village's heart lies the Pit of the Fang, a battleground where they engage in fierce contests atop polar bears during the Hildsmit. This spirited competition determines the Hildener, who will rule alongside the esteemed Keeper Thorum. Intriguingly, the region was once home to the Xanasu clan, embarking on a quest for powerful magic to defy the Lich King. However, their journey remained shrouded in mystery, as the clan never returned from their quest, leaving behind a mysterious legacy in the frosty landscapes of Stormpeaks. In the chilly reaches of the western Stormpeaks, Valkyrian stands as a frosty haven, a settlement of the formidable Frost Vrykul. However, a frosty rift exists between them and their Hildener sisters from Brunhilder village, who harbor resentment for Valkyrian's allegiance to the Lich King. The majority of the Hildener, disdainful of serving the Lich King, resisted his emissaries. Yet Yulda the Storm Speaker, Valkyrian's leader, broke ranks and struck a chilling deal. In exchange for pledging her village's allegiance, the Lich King granted her a transformation into a Valkyr. Once in league with the Scourge during the war against the Lich King, the Hildener of Valkyrian took on a sinister role. Their task involved capturing Proto-Drakes and their eggs, leading them to the Blighted Pool. These waters, saturated with corruption and disease, aim to unleash a plague upon the creatures, morphing them into dreaded, plagued Proto-Drakes. In the frigid tapestry of the Storm Peaks, Valkyrian's chilling saga unfolds, marked by loyalty, discord, and a dark twist of transformation. Nestled just north of Frostfield Lake lies Thunderfall, an imposing sight, a colossal and hushed burial ground haunted by wandering spirits. In ages past, corruption seized the Keeper Loken under the influence of yogg saron Loken's heinous act involved the murder of his brother's wife Sif, and a cunning scheme to frame King Arngrim and the Frost Giants for the crime. Thorum, consumed by wrath, hurled his mighty hammer Krolmir at Arngrim during a fierce battle with Frost Dwarves. The following explosion froze the chaotic moment in time, capturing the shockwave that sent dwarves airborne and claimed many lives. In a final act, Armgrim enchanted Krolmir with a rune, ensuring it remained beyond anyone's grasp. Centuries later, during the conflict against the Lich King, Thorm, aided by adventurers loyal to the Sons of Hodor, unraveled the truth. Filled with remorse, he pledged to confront Loken and sought the adventurer's aid to redeem himself and rebuild the trust with the Frost Giants. At Thunderfall, with the adventurer's support and the agreement of King Yoakum, Thorm apologized for his past transgressions, and the Frost Giants forgave him, allowing Thorm to reclaim his once lost hammer. The Bronzebeard brothers explored the area, with Muradin reflecting on Thunderfall as evidence of the fallibility inherent in the Keepers and their creations. In the heart of the Storm Peaks lies the intriguing Terrace of the Makers, 
a realm nestled in the north central expanse just beyond the chasm from Ulduar. This complex of temples and abodes served as the home and workplace for the keepers. Here, the anticipated artifacts destined for Ulduar found their sanctuary, yet the terrace wears the scars of time. Its once majestic path of the titans lies broken, walkways shattered, and columns cracked or missing. Crowning the terrace are three majestic temples, the Temple of Invention, the Temple of Order, and the Temple of Winter, each situated in the northwest, the northeast, and south respectively. During the war against the Lich King, Iron Dwarves from the formidable Iron Army launched relentless attacks on the vigilant Earthen Warders, guardians of the entire terrace. Halfner the Windborn stood resolute on the central stairs leading north, while Duron the Runerout held his post in the northern edge of the mainland, south of the imposing Ulduar. In the shadow of these ancient temples, a clash of forces unfold, echoing through the terrace of the Makers. Perched atop the loftiest peak in the Storm Peaks, the Temple of Storms stands shrouded in mystery, a testament to the Titan's ancient craftsmanship. Snow delicately blankets its columns, and its open roof frames the sky, allowing the dance of northern lights to intertwine with the stars. Even under the clear skies, the crackle of lightning weaves through the air, creating an ethereal ambience. This sanctuary is the domain of Thorum, the Storm Lord and Guardian of the Temple. Haunted by the loss of his wife Sif, who fell victim to the treachery of his own brother, Loken, Thorm sought solace within these sacred walls for countless years. Little did he know that his eventual war against the Betrayer was a cunning ploy by Loken to lure him away, enabling yogg and Ulduar to ensnare him, driving him into madness. After the reckoning, Thorm's vacant throne echoed the absence of the Stormlord, who had been taken to Ulduar to be corrupted by yogg -Saron. In the aftermath of the war against the Jailer, the vigilant Bronzebeard brothers paid a visit to Thorm in his mountainous abode. Ensuring his well-being, they delved into inquiries about his loyal companion, his pet wolf, Skull, and the whereabouts of Jotun. Amidst the whispers of ancient mysteries, the Temple of Storms remained a sanctuary where past sorrows and present concerns converged. He says he hasn't seen either of them, but hopes Skull will find his way home soon. Now who is Jotun? Jotun is the cherished companion of Keeper Tyr through countless ages. She had a profound bond with the Keeper. When Galakron devoured Tyr's hand, an unyielding friendship led them to embark on a quest within the depths of Azeroth. Together they unearthed a precious silver vein from which Jotun crafted a remarkable prosthetic silver hand for the Keeper. Intriguingly, at Tyr's request, Jotun inscribed the Keeper's new symbol onto his warhammer, forever naming it the Silver Hand. When Tyr and his followers sought refuge in the south of the stolen disk of Norganon, Jotun opted for a different path. Motivated by the ideals of personal sacrifice embraced by the Keeper, he remained behind to divert Loken's attention, facilitating the escape of Tyr's allies. Unfortunately, this act of heroism led to Jotun's capture, and Loken, with malice, cursed his mind. Bound by the curse, Jotun became an unwilling instrument, compelled to scour the lands around Ulduar, now Northrend, to obliterate Tyr, his symbols, and those who embraced his ideals. In a tragic twist, Jotun's first act under the curse shattered the very anvil that had shaped Tyr's silver hand and transformed his hammer, cursed to be unable to die but wishing to have his nightmare end. During the third invasion of the Burning Legion, Galford, a valiant member of Tyr's guard carrying a luminous spark of Tyr, embarked on a daring journey to the frosty lands of Northrend, his mission, to seek assistance in reclaiming the legendary silver hand from the forsaken ground of Tyr's fall. Guided by the Radiant Spark, Galford traversed the path of the Titans, where an unexpected encounter awaited him, the Watcher Jotun. Unbeknownst to Galford, the Spark withheld a crucial detail about Jotun's cursed fate. In a tragic turn of events, Jotun, ensnared by the Watcher's curse, slew Galford and claimed the Spark. However, the tale took an unexpected twist when Lanagosa, a majestic dragon and a valiant paladin adventurer joined forces to track down Galford's assailant. In a fierce confrontation, they confronted Jotun, and the ensuing struggle briefly liberated his mind from the clutches of Loken's curse. In a moment of clarity, Jotun relinquished the spark to the paladin, urging them to escape before the madness reclaimed him. As the paladin and Lanagosa made their hasty retreat, Jotun, haunted by the specter of his own curse, implored them to preserve the memory of his dear friend Tyr. In the frosty embrace of Northrend, a tale of sacrifice, curse, and fleeting redemption unfolded on the path of the Titans. Now we move on to the dungeons. First, we enter the Halls of Stone. 
Within the Halls of Stone, there are four bosses along with the Forge of Wills. Before delving into the details, we unravel an intriguing tale about an ancestor of the Bronzebeard Brothers. The story unfolds when they ventured to visit Ulduar after concluding the war with the Jailer. Their exploration unearthed the lingering presence of iron doors within the mysterious Halls of Stone. Intrigued by the mysteries of their ancestry, the brothers engaged one of the nameless iron doors in conversation, seeking insights into the journey of their ancestor, Mina Stormsmith. The nameless iron dwarf, a witness to Mina's arrival 500 years ago, recounted a gripping tale of Shawnir the Iron Shaper's attempt to annihilate her. Mina had approached Ulduar with a heartfelt plea to resurrect her fallen brother. However, the cold logic of the Iron Dwarves deemed her request unacceptable as she was made of flesh and she was seen as weak in their eyes, leading Shawnir to command her execution. Undeterred, Mina valiantly battled successive waves of Iron Dwarves until her trusty axe shattered in the relentless struggle. In a moment of divine intervention, a spirit bathed in blinding light intervened, rescuing her from the clutches of death. With her new determination, Mina grasped her broken weapon and fought her way out of the formidable depths of Ulduar, leading behind a legacy of resilience and the echoes of a celestial rescue. Now within the Halls of Stone, you have four bosses, the Maiden of Grief, Crystallis, Tribunal of Ages, and Shawnir the Iron Shaper. First, let's talk about the Maiden of Grief. Loken may rule over the dominion of Ulduar, but not every inhabitant is a loyal follower. The Maiden of Grief, burdened with the grim task of thwarting those attempting to reclaim the Halls of Stone, carries out her orders reluctantly. She is a good soldier. A tinge of sorrow colors her actions as she turns against former allies, yet she wields her sorrow-forged weapons with a fierce determination, blending the pain of her heartache into a fearful purpose. We next find Crystallis. In the realm of war, victory isn't solely a product of strength, but a result of formidable armies. Embracing this fundamental truth, Loken issued an order to craft steadfast stone constructs, augmenting the might of his legions. Tasked with overseeing this monumental operation is Crystallis, a formidable force poised to crush any intruder daring to jeopardize its crucial mission. After the thievery of the Dis of Norganon by Tyr, Arkidas, and Ironea, Loken devised the Tribunal of Ages as their successor. Crafting a narrative to conceal his own misdeeds, he tailored historical events within the Tribunal to suit his preferences. Yet this archive, meant to be a seamless cover-up, turned out to be inherently flawed. The histories contained within took on a life of their own, twisting even beyond Loken's grasp of understanding. Consequently, the Tribunal of Ages stands as a testament to the muddled echoes of history, far from being a reliable record. Now the final boss is Shawnir the Iron Shaper. Serving as one of Loken's most trusted lieutenants, Shawnir the Iron Shaper assumed the role of Master of the Forge of Wills. Shawnir, with an apparent zeal, eagerly crafted iron creations to please his master. Fond of boasting about the perceived weakness of the earth and beings and considering flesh creatures frail, he held a disdain for them. As the war against the Lich King unfolded, Shawnir met his demise at the hands of the Alliance during their raid on Ulduar. His once formidable dagger, the Flesh Shaper, ended up in the possession of those he had deemed so fragile. Now a quick little mention of the Forge of Wills and the Forge of Origination, but I'll go into a more detailed explanation on each when I do a video on the Titans and the Keepers. The Forge of Wills, as mentioned before, which is located within the Halls of Stone, can draw on the life essence of Azeroth itself, giving shape and sentience to creatures of living stone and metal. The Forge of Origination, which is located in Oldham to the south, would be used to cleanse the planet if the flora and fauna became corrupted and could be activated by Algalon the Observer so the planet could start anew. Now we move on to the Halls of Lightning. Nestled in the vast titan city of Ulduar, the Halls of Lightning, situated in the east, served as the ominous workshop of the duplicitous Loken. Once a loyal servant of the Pantheon and a prime sentinel, he now toiled in treachery, churning out legions of iron Vrykul to execute his dark master's sinister designs. From his imposing throne, Loken orchestrated his forces, flanked by storm and fire elementals along with his most formidable servants and commanders. In the heart of his formidable domain, adventurers faced the ultimate showdown, challenging Loken in his last stand. The echoes of battle sounded through the Halls of Lightning, marking the decisive moment when the treacherous Prime Sentinel met his ultimate defeat. Now within the Halls of Lightning, you have four bosses. General Varngrim, Vulcan, Ionar and Loken. First, let's start with General Varngrim. In the mighty legion of Loken's iron forces, one figure towers above them all, 
the indomitable General Vargrim. At the forefront of Loken's Halls of Lightning, this Iron Commander ruthlessly enforces his master's dominion, ensuring that any intruders in their path meet a swift and uncompromising end. Now the next boss you encounter is Vulcan, and he has quite a longer backstory than the others, basically the same length as Loken. We start back in the Winter Scorn War. As far as the time frame for the Winter Scorn Wars, I hadn't found an actual time date, like 500 years before the Dark Portal type of things for some dates. This one just gave me many years after Loken's betrayal, so take with that what you will, and if you actually find a date, uh, let me know, because I wasn't able to find one. But let's talk about the Winter Scorn Wars. In the vast expanse of the storm peaks surrounding Ulduar, Vulcan and Ignis eyed a land ripe for conquest, their fiery ambitions ablaze. Recognizing the need for a formidable army, the Fire Giants set their sights on the fierce Winter Scorn clan of Rykul. Through forceful means, they seized control of the clan, igniting the flames of battle lust and crafting armor and weapons designed to counter the other Titan forged. As the newly formed army prepared for conquest, the dreaded curse of flesh struck, affecting their forces. Undeterred by this setback, Vulcan and Ignis pressed on with their goal, acknowledging that relying solely on the Winter Scorn would no longer suffice. To bolster their ranks, the giants sculpted potent molten golems and iron constructs of their own creation. The massive Winter Scorn army descended upon the unsuspecting Earthen, storming their underground lairs and leaving devastation in their wake. Survivors from the Earthen sought refuge with Tyr, Arcetus, and Ironea, who had managed to elude Loken's pursuit. Outraged by the tales of destruction, Tyr and his companions rushed to the Earthen's aid, leading the bravest Earthen in skirmishes against the Winter Scorn. Tyr, Arcetus, and Ironea fortified defense to fend off further assaults. Eventually, the combined forces of the Earthen and their allies repelled the Winter Scorn. Undeterred by their initial failure, Vulcan and Ignis returned to their fiery forges, fashioning an even more formidable army. Beyond golems and construct, they crafted enchanted snares to enslave entire flights of proto-dragons. These winged creatures turned into instruments of war. The dragons were armed with fiery weapons to sow terror among the Earthen. The ensuing Winter Scorn assaults shattered the Earthen's defenses, forcing them to scatter across icy mountain passes. Vrykul and golems pursued them on the ground, while proto-dragons launched attacks from the skies. Even the formidable trio of Tyr, Arcetus, and Ironea had to flee from the relentless fury of the Winter Scorn. In a turn of fortune, Tyr rallied the dragon aspects to his cause. Together, they shattered the golems and constructs forged by Ignis and Vulcan, freed the enslaved proto-dragons, and plunged the Winter Scorn into a deep slumber, bringing an end to the harrowing conflict. Amid the war against the Lich King, Vulcan, following Loken's orders, found his dwelling within the Halls of Lightning, nestled in the Iron Crucible. Tirelessly toiling day and night, he dedicated himself to crafting golems, amplifying the ranks of Loken's formidable armies. The relentless endeavor posed a severe threat to the sons of Hoder, who deemed him a danger and issued a decree for his demise. Now we move on to Ironar. Loken doesn't lean solely on his iron minions for personal defense. Instead, he harnesses the raw power of lightning itself. In a curious alliance, Ionar and its companions found refuge within the Halls of Lightning, offering unwavering loyalty and a readiness to ruthlessly eliminate any who dare challenge their newfound master. Now we move on to the one who caused so much trouble for us on Azeroth and the other keepers, Loken. With him I figure it works to go into his full backstory, and the others will get their stories told when I do a video on them and the Titans. Loken. A keeper forged by the Pantheon to lead the Titan forged armies against the Old Gods, received his power from Norganon. In a fierce battle alongside Mimiron, they triumphed over Neptulon the Tidehunter. However, Loken's life took a tragic turn when an affair with Sif, his brother Thorm's wife, led to a disastrous accident. Manipulated by the imprisoned Yogg Saron, Loken, driven by fear of losing Sif, inadvertently caused her death. Overwhelmed with guilt but afraid to confess to Thorm, Loken deceived his brother, blaming Ardengrim, the King of Frost Giants, for the tragedy. To end the ensuing war, Loken created an army using the Forge of Wills, unknowingly spreading the curse of flesh that would transform Titanforged into flesh. Desperate to conceal his actions, Loken orchestrated Mimiron's death, subdued Hoder and Freya with yogg -Saron's corruption, and convinced Helia to imprison Odin in the Halls of Valor. Learning of the Pantheon's demise, he exiled all Titan force from Ulduar and withdrew into its depths. The only witnesses to Loken's betrayal were Tyr and Arcetus, 
who alongside Iron Ann and allies, stole the discs of Norganon to uncover the extent of his treachery. In pursuit, Loken sent monstrous Cathraxi, but Tyr sacrificed himself, allowing his comrades to escape with the discs. Terrified of the consequences of Tyr's group exposed his actions to Algalon, Loken fabricated the Tribunal of Ages, filling it with false information to cover his tracks, manipulating the signal to Algalon. He ensured no living being could contact him until Loken's death. The complex web of deception and tragedy unfolded within the shadows of Ulduar's depths. For countless millennia, yogg saron languished in captivity, holding the Keepers, including Loken, in a muted state within Ulduar. His control over them was feeble, and attempts to persuade them into directly aiding the Old God had met with resistance. The turning point came with Cho'Gall, a member of the Old God-worshipping Twilight Hammers clan, infiltrated Ulduar, weakening yogg saron's chains. Suddenly, the entity's influence of the Keepers intensified, transforming as sturdy as iron. Under yogg command, Loken was tasked with using the Forge of Wills to fashion a new army. In Loken's skilled hands, the Forge unleashed hordes of Iron Dwarves and Vrykul, hungry only for bloodshed and war. During the war against the Lich King, Thorm, aided by adventurers aligned with the Sons of Hoder, unraveled the truth and reclaimed his weapon and armor. Fueled by righteous fury, he confronted his treacherous brother in a bid for justice. However, it proved to be an intricate deception orchestrated by Loken. The ruse successfully lured Thorm from the safety of the Temple of Storms, where proximity to his dark master granted Loken the power to withstand Thorm's assault. Subsequently, Loken captured Thorm and his loyal protodrake, Varanus, intending to plunge them into madness through the influence of yogg saron Loken's schemes extended to enlisting Ignis the Furnace Master for transformative tasks. One notable instance involving morphing Varanus into the formidable plated monstrosity known as Razor Scale. Additionally, Loken commissioned the creation of Kolagarn, a colossal stone construct to guard the shattered walkway leading to Ulduar's inner halls. Upon Loken's demise in the Halls of Lightning, he ominously proclaimed that his death heralded the world's end. The map of Azeroth erupted in flames, launching a beacon of light skyward. As revealed by the Archivum Consul in Ulduar, Loken's death triggered the Algalon failsafe, an emergency signal leading to the arrival of Algalon the Observer. This signaled potential planetary failure, initiating a diagnostic process with two possible outcomes. Reply code Alpha indicated all was well, while reply code Omega signified planetary reorigination. When questioned about the latter, the console explained the Titan's plan, the complete destruction of Azeroth and its life forms, followed by the meticulous reconstruction of the planet from its base elements. In essence, the dire warning in Loken's dying breath hinted at the catastrophic consequence of his demise, a potential reset of Azeroth through the Titan's reorigination process. Now we move on to many people's favorite raid, Ulduar. First, let's start off with the official Blizzard description of it, and then move on to the history of this grand structure. For millennia, Ulduar has remained undisturbed by mortals, far away from their concerns and their struggles. Yet since its recent discovery, many have wondered what the structure's original purpose may have been. Some thought it a city built to herald the glory of its makers. Some thought it a vault containing immeasurable treasures, perhaps even relics of the mighty titans themselves. Such speculations were wrong. Beyond Uduar's gates lies no city, no treasure vault, no final answer to the Titan's mysteries. All that awaits those who dare set foot in Uduar is a horror even the Titans could not, would not destroy, an evil they merely contained. Beneath ancient Uduar, the old god of death lies, whispering, tread carefully, or its prison will become your tomb. Now let's look at the history of Uduar. Upon the triumph over Galakrond, the Proto-Dragons earned the admiration of the Keepers, who sought the Titan's blessing for their new guardianship of Azeroth. However, Odin, the resolute Prime Designate and leader of the Keepers, harbored distrust toward the Proto-Dragons, preferring his vision of an elite force characterized by unwavering valor. He set his sights on the Vrykul, offspring of the Titan Forged, as the ideal candidates for his army. Despite the objections from other Keepers, Odin remained steadfast in his pursuit of this unique endeavor. Within the hollowed halls of Ulduar, Odin designed a section to serve as the headquarters for this envisioned army. Within the hollowed halls of Ulduar, Odin designed a section to serve as the headquarters for his envisioned army. Calling upon his friend and Titan Forge sorceress Helia, he harnessed her power to separate this portion of Ulduar and suspend it in ethereal skies above Azeroth. 
This celestial abode, known as the Halls of Valor, became the dwelling place of the formidable Valajar, and the ultimate reward for the most deserving Vrykul warriors who were summoned to serve Odin eternally. While Ulduar dutifully contained yogg saron its performance was incomplete, allowing the old god's malevolent influence to seep through. yogg sarons dark essence permeated the continent, crystallizing into Saronite and corrupting everything it touched. His insidious whispers accompanied the spread of Saronite, tempting countless souls into madness, including the Keeper Loken. After millennia in captivity, yogg sarons shackles began to slacken, allowing the malevolent entity to seize control of the prison. Following his insidious commands, Loken launched an assault on the city, wrestling control from the resident earth and populating the Forge of Wills with Iron Dwarves and Vrykul. These newly forged creatures expelled the remaining earthen and mecha gnomes from Ulduar, venturing into Northrend to sow chaos. In the aftermath of the Lich King's defeat, Auric Trueheart dedicated his time around Ulduar to uncovering the tales of Tyr, the only Titan Keeper who confronted Loken during his betrayal. Additionally, he stumbled upon a Vrykul saga recounting the creation of a formidable shield crafted by Tyr for his Vrykul champion. During these events, the modest alliance and horde encampments gave way to a more substantial settlement known as Copperpot Camp, run by the human Chester Copperpot and safeguarded by the vigilant Copperpot goons. This medium-sized camp became a focal point, complete with a nearby meeting stone for travelers. Amidst the third invasion by the Burning Legion, Uluar appeared to have shed its previous corruption, with the Earthen and Mecha Gnomes reclaiming control under the watchful eyes of their keepers. The defensive systems now included Iron Vrykul, Frost Giants, and Iron Dwarves seamlessly integrated into Ulduar's operations. Notably, the facility seemed designed for regular visitors, complete with visitor information representatives and curators ensuring accessibility and maintenance. Visitors were even encouraged to share their feedback through a visitor satisfaction survey. However, during the Legion's assault, demons infiltrated Ulduar, driven by the quest to unearth information leading to the Pillars of Creation. Adding to the chaos, the whispers of the once-defeated old god yogg saron echoed once more, accompanied by the return of the Enraki groups, their purpose shrouded in mystery. In a second attack, the Legion targeted Ulduar to capture Hodor, triggered a fierce defense by the Valajar forces, who valiantly repelled the invaders. The Bronzier brothers brought news that Ulduar was in the process of reconstruction following the Legion's assault. The resilient Earth and Mechanomes had reclaimed their positions, graciously incorporating the liberated Iron Dwarves into their fold. Despite yogg sarons defeat and his lifeless form securely confined, the echoes of his whispers lingered, resonating not only across Northrend, but also within the very halls of Ulduar. Now there are quite a few bosses within the raid, and I could go over every single one of them, but some don't have much lore, and others I plan to do a full video on, like with the Keepers. But there are a couple I feel are worth going over due to their lore. So first, let's go over Razor Scale. I've mentioned Razor Scale a little bit, but I think it's worth talking a little bit more about Razor Scale. In the majestic Storm Peaks, Varanus reigns as the revered brood mother of the Proto Dragons. She roamed freely until Thorm desired his loyal Drake by his side once again to confront his duplicitous brother. It had been a long time since they had ridden together. When the adventurer assists Thorm in reclaiming his old friend, finding her at her nest, they face Loken. However, things don't go as planned as discussed earlier. The story takes a sad turn. Instead of defeating Loken as Thorm had envisioned, he and Varanus are taken captive into Ulduar. While Thorm falls under Yogg-Saron's control, Varanus is manipulated as well, with metal plates attached to her body by Ignis, and she becomes Razor Scale. She becomes lost when Yogg takes over her mind, forcing the adventurers to end her life, preventing her from soaring freely again. In the end, we hope she is at peace. Next up we have Algalon the Observer. After Azeroth's grand reshaping, the Pantheon geared up for their departure, eager to seek out new world souls. As a parting gift, they selected the constellar Algalon the Observer to stand sentinel and watch over the world. Amenthul, foreseeing the potential havoc the old gods could wreck, took precautionary measures. In case corruption threatened to engulf Azeroth, Algalon would be summoned to assess the situation. Based on his findings, Algalon would either transmit the benign reply code Alpha if corruption was absent, or the ominous reply code Omega if it was present. Omega, once triggered, would activate the Forge of Origination, purging the planet of life and corruption. 
despite the devastation the world's soul would endure. Algalon's presence on Azeroth could be prompted by two scenarios, either a direct summoning through Titan machinery in Ulduar or elsewhere, or the demise of the Prime Designate, the Pantheon's chosen defender responsible for safeguarding the planet, overseeing Yogg-Saron's prison, and maintaining the Forge of Wills. Driven to the brink of madness by the Pantheon's deafening silence and haunted by the whispers of Yogg-Saron, Keeper Loken succumbed to the turmoil within. The unintentional demise of his beloved Sif further fueled his descent into insanity. In a daring move, Loken orchestrated a coup against his fellow Keepers within the confines of Ulduar. Emerging victorious over what he perceived as threats, Loken seized control of the facility's machinery. In a bold and audacious act, he crowned himself Prime Designate, snatching the esteemed title from the grasp of Keeper Odin. Paralyzed by the fear that one of his fellow Keepers might expose his treachery by contacting Algalon or the Titans, Loken took drastic measures. He deliberately sabotaged Ulduar's communication devices, forever silencing any connection to the Pantheon or Azeroth's Celestial Guardian. In the midst of the war against the Lich King, Loken and his formidable armies posed a dire threat to the world's delicate equilibrium. The Prime Designate met his end in the Halls of Lightning, defeated by champions representing both the Horde and the Alliance. As the news of Loken's demise echoed, Algalon the Observer swiftly returned to Azeroth, prompted by the signal of the Fallen Keeper's death. Venturing deeper into the facility after conquering the malevolent old god yogg -Saron, adventurers guided by the intrepid Brand Bronzebeard reached the Celestial Planetarium. There, they bore witness to the arrival of Algalon, initiating his critical analysis of Azeroth's corruption levels. The Constellar issued a grave warning. If systemic corruption was detected, he would be compelled to trigger the reorigination process, deeming it necessary for the greater cosmic order. As Bran sought to disrupt Algalon's signal, his companions engaged in a fierce battle to thwart the Observer's attempt to commence the Purge. Despite Algalon's assertion that the mortals were destined to lose, the champions emerged victorious, challenging the Constellar's preconceptions about the flaws of their kind. Acknowledging the fallibility of his calculations, Algalon amended the reply code to abort reorigination, bestowing the code upon Bran and his allies. He cautioned that in the absence of a response from the Observer, reorigination would proceed regardless. He advised Bran to send the code from somewhere close to the sky. Algalon then vanished, choosing to observe Azeroth from a distant vantage point in the years to follow. Bran, convinced that Dalaran was the ideal location for transmitting the signal, hurriedly left Ulduar. Racing to the Mage City, he handed the code to Ronan, the leader of the Kirin Tor. In the Eventide City, Ronan passionately delivered his speech as he transmitted the message, unleashing a breathtaking display of colors and light that more importantly spared Azeroth from the impending purge of life. Now we move on to yogg -Saron, the last boss of the raid, but also the one that has caused so much trouble for everyone over the years. In the ancient records of Azeroth's history, yogg -Saron is a profoundly malevolent old god. He wielded a chaotic tyranny that reverberated across the world. He orchestrated the creation of the Curse of Flesh, a malevolent design aimed at assimilating the Titans' ingenious creations. When the Titans engaged in a cosmic war against the Old Gods, aiming to obliterate their citadels, a grim revelation surfaced. The infestation of these entities had become so entwined with Azeroth that eradicating the Old Gods would spell the doom of the world itself. Faced with this dire conundrum, the Pantheon opted for a different strategy. Rather than obliterating the Old Gods, they chose to neutralize their power and bind them within Azeroth for the enduring lifespan of the world. yogg Surround found its home in the depths of Ulduar, nestled in the far northern realms of the flourishing planet. Six Titanic Watchers, Loken, Thorm, Hoder, Tyr, Mimiron, and Freya, were appointed as vigilant custodians, tasked with ensuring the near-eternal captivity of this malevolent force. Yet the imprisonment was not absolute. Yogg-Saron's malevolent influence manifested as Saronite, a dark substance that permeated the continent, crystallizing and corrupted all it touched. The whispers of the imprisoned entity insinuated themselves with the Saronite, seducing many into the throes of madness, including the Keeper Loken. The haunting legacy of Yogg-Saron's presence echoed through the ages, leaving a lingering mark on Azeroth. For eons, Yogg-Saron held the Keepers, including Loken, in a quiet and complacent state. His influence over them was feeble, struggling to convince them to directly serve the Old God. However, the arrival of Cho'Gall from Twilight's Hammer Clan changed the game. Cho'Gall weakened yogg chains, unleashing an iron-strong surge of influence over the Keepers. 
The Oxyron's malevolence extended beyond Ulduar, corrupting the roots of the World Tree Vordrasil, leading to the creation of the Emerald Nightmare. Despite the immediate destruction of Vordrasil, the corruption persisted, affecting the Grizzlemoth Firbolgs, who later inhabited its remains. The Oxyron's impact on Azeroth's history became evident during the Ulduar Raid, where adventurers witnessed visions connected to key moments in the world's past. First, the creation of the Dragon Soul by Naltharion and the other dragon aspects emerged during the War of the Ancients, marking the cataclysmic Great Sundering. The assassination of King Lane by Garona followed, sealing the fate of Stormwind at the conclusion of the First War. Lastly, a haunting vision materialized, revealing the Lich King's torment of Bolvar Fordragon, destined to become the new Lich King after Arthas Menethil's demise. Within the eerie echoes of this final vision, the voice of Yogg Saron resonated, proclaiming a prophecy that would unfold with Arthas' defeat by the Ashen Verdict. He will learn, no king rules forever, only death is eternal. These foreboding words, chillingly echoed by Tyrannus Menethil's spirit in his final moments, mark the unavoidable path of destiny and demise. As the old god's voice echoed prophecies during the encounter, foretelling the demise of kings and the eternal nature of death, Adventurers from the Alliance and Horde, guided by Bran Bronzebeard, rose to the challenge and ultimately defeated yogg -Saron. Now one last thing I'd like to mention is the Curse of Flesh. The Curse of Flesh turns those beings made of stone and metal into flesh. And thanks to that, it actually gave us the Dwarves, Gnomes, and Humans, along with a few other races, but I figure I'll cover those in another video later on. So I'd like to go over those three, since I think it's nice to know more about the races that we play every day or have played in the past. First up is the Dwarves. The Titans forged the earth and to sculpt the deep reaches of the world. When Arkidas and his companions pilfered the Dis of Norganon from Loken, they embarked on a journey southward to Oldaman. With a handful of earth and mechanomes, they concealed the stolen Dis within the ancient halls. Fearing the looming curse of flesh, the earthen pleaded for a respite, entering a dormant state until a remedy could be discovered. In a selfless act, the Mechanomes, cognizant of their shared curse, offer to remain vigilant and guard over their earthen brethren during their extended slumber. Most of the earthen eventually turned into dwarves, but not all of them. There remains a sizable population of earthen in Deepholm, Oldaman, and Ulduar. Now while quite a few earthen sought refuge within Oldaman, not all of them did. Others rallied alongside the Night Elves under the command of Gerard Shadowsong to confront the impending threat of the Burning Legion. As the War of the Ancients unfolded, culminating in the cataclysmic implosion of the Well of Eternity and the subsequent Great Sundering, the still-awakening Earthen keenly felt the reverberation of the Earth's agony. Overwhelmed by the shared pain, they retreated to their ancestral sanctuaries, the Titan cities of Oldham, Oldaman, and Ulduar, and entered a prolonged hibernation. In their absence, the responsibility of safeguarding Oldaman fell upon the Mechanomes. With the passing of time, many of these mechanical beings departed or succumbed to wear and tear, until one resilient mechanome remained. Realizing her days were numbered, she expended her last reserves of energy to activate the hibernation chambers, ensuring the earth would not be consigned to oblivion in the vaults, a poignant gesture before her inevitable demise. Upon awakening, a considerable number of them discovered a curious transformation. Their once formidable command over stone and earth had diminished and their stony exteriors had changed into the softness of smooth skin. With newfound forms, these flesh earth ventured beyond the Titan city and over time laid the foundations of Ironforge in the rugged landscapes of Dunmoreau. Upon the rugged landscapes they claimed as their own, the dwarves bestowed the name Kazmadan, a tribute to the mighty Titan shaper Kazgaroth, in reverence to their Titan progenitor. The dwarves erected a giant altar, a sacred space within the mountain's core, it was here amidst the stony depths that they forged a monumental forge. This forge birthed the city, destined to be known as Iron Forge. Throughout the ages, in the heart of Kazmadan, the dwarves, skilled artisans of the earth, laid the foundation for a legacy that resonated with the echoes of the titans. Now we move on to the gnomes. In the aftermath of Loken's betrayal, the mechanomes in Oldaman found themselves thrust into the role of caretakers for the facility, sharing their responsibility with a handful of earthen who had remained active. Arkidas and Irenea, consumed by their quest to cure the curse of flesh, descended into the lower chambers of Oldaman, entering prolonged periods of hibernation, leaving the mechanomes and the remaining earthen to navigate the intricacies of the facility. With the cataclysmic great sundering, the earthen entered stasis, leaving the mechanomes as the sole custodians. 
However, even they were not immune to the relentless curse of flesh, leading to their transformation into the beings we now recognize as gnomes. Stripped of purpose and direction, the gnomes abandon Old Man, severing ties 3,000 years before the Dark Portal's emergence. The initial generation of gnomes faced the harsh challenges of the frigid mountains west of Old Man, contending with unforgiving weather, ice trolls, and various perils that lurked in the surroundings. Over the passing generations, their focus shifted to technological progress, recognizing it as the key to survival in their hostile environment. In a few short generations, the gnomes relinquished their knowledge of Titanforged origins, forging a new society. Deep within the frosty peaks of what would later be called Dunmoreau, they constructed heavily fortified homes, crafting a resilient society that thrived amidst the rugged wilderness. Humans traced their ancestry back to the Vrykul, a formidable race of half-giants hailing from Northrend, originally created by the Titans. Around 15,000 years before the Dark Portal, the Curse of Flesh emerged, causing Dragonflayer Vrykul women to bear small and deformed offspring. Deemed aberrations by King Ymiron, ruler of the Dragonflayer clan, these children faced destruction, yet some were hidden by their parents among a Vrykul community in Tyrus Fall Glades, later forming the foundations of the Northern Eastern Kingdoms. Through the passing of ages, these afflicted Vrykul descendants, known as humans, continued their degeneration into mortal beings. As millennia unfolded, human tribes thrived in the Eastern Kingdoms, navigating conflicts with both rival tribes and the forest trolls of the Imani Empire for territory and dominance. The truth of their Vrykul heritage remained shrouded and forgotten by humanity until the fateful encounter of Vrykul in Northrend during the war against the Lich King. And that's going to do it for this one. Hopefully you did enjoy. This has been my longest video in a while, so if you made it this far, thank you for sticking around this long. I appreciate it. And do take care of yourself. I'll see you in the next one.